Thank you, Lisa. A very beautiful piece. Very soothing. She's going to have to quit doing that. <laughs> no, it was good. Very nice. It's, it's nice to hear that. I enjoy the piano. Well, there were two men that were traveling together. They were traveling down on their journey when suddenly a bear out of nowhere met them. One of them very quickly climbed a tree and concealed himself. He was hidden in the branches, nowhere to be seen. The other one, seeing that he must be attacked, he fell flat on the ground, and then the bear came up on him. The bear felt him with his snout. He smelled him all over. He held his breath. The guy held his breath. He feigned the appearance of death as much as he possibly could. The bear soon left him, for it said that a bear will not touch a dead body. When he was quite gone, the other traveler descended from the tree. He came over to his friend, and he knelt down, and he asked him, he said, what advice did the bear give you? You know, kind of jokingly. His companion looked up at him and said, he told me, never travel with a friend who will desert you at the approach of danger. <laughs> well, we joke a little bit about that. It's, it's a little humorous, but the point is there. This brings us to our topic today. Perhaps one of the most thought-provoking questions asked in the Bible is asked by no other than Cain. When Cain killed his brother, God approached him. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4 and start there. And we know the story leading up to this. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 3 through 8, kind of set this up. Genesis 4 and verse 3. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of, uh, of the, his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do, if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and, it desire, and its desire is for you but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he killed him. Now there's a lot that just went on here. What we see here is that Cain did not take the suggestion or the advice of God. Right there in verse 6, he said, Why are you angry? And then he went on to say, if you do well, basically, will you not be accepted? Will you not be rewarded? And if you do not do well, you will fall to sin. That's what he pointed out. He warned Cain about making the right choices and that sin was right there, ready to pull him away. And this is a, this is a great message for us today, making the right choices and sin right there pulling us away if we make the wrong choices. Now, that's not my direct topic, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But here, he was told to have rule over sin. Be in control. Watch what you're doing and have rule over it. In other words, make sure that you're in control of yourself at all times. Now, notice what happened in verse 9, the scene here in verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said... I do not know, and here's the question, am I my brother's keeper? When the Lord inquired concerning Abel, Cain's response was, I don't know. He lied. And then he went on to say, am I my brother's keeper? 
This is the question of our focus today. This question, it would be well for all of us to ask ourselves: am I my brother's keeper? Are we our brother's keeper? Do we have the responsibility to watch out and care for one another? Well, this is a question asked by many in the world today. And to avoid any kind of responsibility, most people in general choose not to get involved with this kind of a question. They don't want any part of it. People don't want the heavy burden of guilt that possibly could come from someone else making a wrong choice or a bad decision. And it's, it's, it's kind of upsetting how that works. But here's the thing. God's Word has a lot to say about this topic. And it gives us a lot of detail on just how we are to treat our brother. Now, we look in the New Testament, and it becomes very clear that the answer to this question is, and we'll move on, I'll come back to that. To this question, am I my brother's keeper? There's so many passages that we can look at. And we're not obviously going to look at them all today because we would be here till this time next week. But I do want to look at just a few in, in starting to answer this question. Number one, I want to talk about our responsibilities to another. So, kind of a sub-question, we are, or are we, however you want to look at it, you have to make this choice for yourself, to love one another. To love one another. Look at John chapter 13 to start with. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. John chapter 13, starting at verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And this is how we're supposed to love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. And then this is the, the distinction that comes from fulfilling this command. Verse 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So he also pointed out that this is the very act, the very act, it is a sign to the entire world. He said all, he didn't say, you know, by this only the other people in the church or by this your family will know. He said, by this, all. And that includes everybody. This is a, a sign to the entire world that if we have this love for one another, everybody will know that we are God's people. We are God's disciples. We have to fulfill this command. Now let's move ahead a few chapters to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, starting at verse 12, 12 through 17. Verse 15 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another, as I have loved you. Then he goes on to explain all this and everything that goes with this. It says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. You are my friends if you do whatever I have commanded you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from the, my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask in the Father in my name, of the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Now, I, I think the interesting point from this section of scripture is it's encapsulated by the same thing. Verse 12 says, this is my command that you love one another. And then explains what that's about. And then verse 17 he says, these things I commanded you that you love one another. So it fits. It's, it's all inclusive. Now, when you read this section of scripture, there's probably more than this, but I picked up four four things or four 
suggestions, if you will, from this section that we can apply to a Christian love. And those four things that I picked out here are, number one, the obligation, number two, the sufficiency, number three, there's a pattern here, and then number four, the motive. So just take a, we'll take just a quick minute and, and kind of look at this or dissect it, you know. First of all, the obligation. Christ lays down the obligation, and this includes and is directed to all Christians, all people who believe and follow him, who believe in his way of life, who are a part of God's family. The obligation is to them to cherish and have this kind of love that he had for us. We're to have this. That's the obligation. Now, you can go into a lot more detail, but that's kind of short and simple. But that's the obligation. Now, the sufficiency, his one commandment was love one another. Love one another. And he says that will make you wise. Now, how do you get that? Well, when you love one another and you do this the way he loved us, we begin to shape ourselves to the right form, and that's the form of Christ. And there's so much wisdom in that, but that's the beginning of it. The one thing uh, that's very needful here was that they should be knit together. We should be knit together as true participators. See, this involves taking action. True participators of Christ's life, Christ's love, the love that he had for us, then we are participators by taking that love and having it for each other. And it, like I say, it knits together and it forms a tight and wholesome bond, a bond that Christ set up, that God set up. Then you look at the pattern. The pattern that he proposes for us is even more magnificent than it appears at first sight. So if, and we're not going to turn there, but if you read just a few verses back before you get here in John 15, Christ said, and I'll just quote it to you, As the Father has loved me, so I love you. So we start to see the absolute best pattern that could ever be laid down for us. It's not so much that Christ said, I love you, now love each other. He took it back a notch. He said, as God the Father loved me, I love you, you love each other. And I think, I mean, there's no better pattern than that. That is the pattern set forth by God the Father. And then when you look at this last, the motivation here, it says that love, the motivation of that kind of love received into our hearts, it will absolutely guarantee to conquer any problems and trials that we face. It doesn't say it will do away with them, but it will conquer them. And that's the difference. We still have to go through troubles and trials, a lot like the first you know, we heard in the first message. We still have to go through them. But this is how we get through them. This conquers them. And it, it puts our heart in the right perspective, in the right place. It puts our heart in line with Christ's heart and also in line with God's heart. It goes back to the pattern, back to the sufficiency, and back to the obligation. So let's notice uh, what a few of Christ's disciples had to say about this. Um, the following here is what Paul had. If you turn to Romans uh, chapter 13, this is what Paul taught about this. Romans 13, verse 8. Romans 13, verse 8 says, Owe no one anything except this, to love one another. For he who loves one another has fulfilled the law. Do we understand what kind of, um, I guess, soothing, um, I don't know, the feeling that you get, the, the, uh, the comfort, I guess, is what I'm looking for, that we have when we fulfill this kind of law. It is a comfort. It's a peace. We talked about this you know, several months ago. It's a peace that we have that only comes from God the Father. 
in Jesus Christ. When we fulfill this law, that's what we have. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians 4 and verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. And this is why. This is why Paul said, you have no need that I need to write this. He said, for you yourself are taught by God to love one another. Absolutely amazing. Paul didn't have to go back and reiterate this. He said, God taught you this. God has taught us this through God's word. We've seen it, and now we need to live it. That's what he's saying here. Paul just laid it out the way it was. And I think that's really neat. You know, I always admired Paul, and I look forward to meeting him one day. But uh, he, just, he, just, he sounds like a real stand-up guy. You know, just this is the way it is. He didn't mince words. See what Peter had to say about it. Look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. First Peter 1 and verse 22. <clears throat> so since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. We've talked about what fervent is, and you know, uh, one of the famous scriptures that we like to quote on that is, is uh, James where he talks about uh, the prayer, James 5.17, I believe it is, you know, the effectual fervent prayer. Here he says, love one another fervently. That's deep, and that's complete, and that's with commitment. Love one another fervently with a pure heart. So let's finally, the last one we'll look at, is go back and look at John. Actually, we'll look at 1 John, 1 John first. Look at 1 John chapter 3, and verse 11. 1 John 3 and verse 11. <clears throat> For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And John was just pointing this out to the fact that this is nothing new. Christ didn't come on the scene, and we pick it up in Matthew and walk with the disciples and, and interact with people and then decide when someone asks him, you know, what's the greatest commandment? This was from the beginning. God the Father set this in motion in the very beginning. Look at Second John chapter 5, or verse 5 here. Second John verse 5. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Talking to the church, the church, the people are the church. That's us. Again, re-emphasizing the fact that this is nothing new. This was a command from the very beginning. So, without a doubt, without question, when we ask, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, simply yes. We are our brother's keeper. Scripture, just the ones we looked at so far, affirm that. And there are several other passages that can give us the same answers. But what I'd like to do now is I'm going to read just, uh, and I'll quickly go through these with you, um, just a, a handful of straight-up points. And then I want to come back and look at about five of them. And, uh, again, they're kind of brief. But I'll just go through these points quickly and reference the scripture, and then we'll come back and look at a few of them kind of in detail. So I called this section, How Do We Show Our Love for One Another? How do we show our love for one another? Well, the first uh, bullet point, if you will, is receive one another. And you can find that in Romans 15, verse 7. And we'll come back and look at that in just, in just a few minutes. The next one would be, we are to edify one another. Edify, build each other up, encourage each other. Romans 14, verse 19. How about this? We are to serve one another. 
Galatians 5 and verse 13. Then another one, we are to bear one another's burdens. That one's tough, but we'll take a look at it. Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, talks about that one. And these are all scriptures you can go back and look at and um, do a, a detailed study on. How about the fact that we are to be forgiving one another? Just one scripture on that's Ephesians 4, and verse 32. There's several scriptures we can look at there. Now this one here seems a little odd, doesn't it? It's called submitting to one another. Submitting to one another. Ephesians 5, verse 21. That's a short scripture. It says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. We are to exhort one another. Hebrews, or Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13. And how about this? We are to consider one another. That seems simple enough, doesn't it? Consider. Well, Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25 goes to that one. And then the last one I want to throw at you is we are to be hospitable to one another. 1 Peter 4, verses 8 through 10. So I know we went through this kind of quickly, but I want to take now just a few minutes to go through Oh, half a dozen of them or so, just maybe five or six of them. But in light of the passages here, all these talk about one another. Do this, do that, to, with, one another. It's others. It's taking care of others. So, again, there's no doubt that we are to be our brother's keeper. But that brings up a very deep question that we have to ask ourselves, and only we can answer this how well am I doing at being my brother's keeper how well am I doing again that's something only we can answer and I say that because well we think we can answer for somebody else because we see what they're doing but we don't know what's going on in that person's life maybe we should maybe we need to find out but we can't make that kind of a judgment it's personal. So to stimulate our thinking and to help us re-examine how well we are fulfilling our obligation because we've established through Scripture that we're commanded to do this. So that makes it an obligation. So to fulfill this obligation to one another, let's consider just a few of these points. Some of these points that we can take a brief look at, I think will help us maybe have a different perspective or maybe at least a deeper perspective on the fact that we are our brother's keeper. So I call this section evaluating our role, evaluating our role. And again, we're going to cover a lot of what we already did, but in more detail. So the first one is, you know, when we become a brother or sister in Christ or an acquaintance, somebody just visiting, here's the first point. Do we receive them into the family of God, or do we, do we ignore them? And we're going to go to Romans 15, verse 7 on this one. I'll repeat that again. Do we receive them into the family of God or ignore them? Romans 15 and verse 7. Verse 7 says, Therefore, receive one another. And this is how. Just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So, it's commanded to receive one another. But it, he doesn't let us off the hook there. How? Just as Christ received us. Well, that takes it up a little higher. That puts a little more pressure on us. But then he goes in and throws this, to the glory of God. We are to do everything, everything to the glory of God. We are to glorify God in everything we do. And that's tough. It's hard. But that is the expectation. We are to live up to the expectation. And it is an ongoing challenge. You know, every day we're faced with problems and trials and difficulties that come, you know, come our way. 
But with that, we're supposed to handle them the best we can with God backing us. That means go to God and ask for help and glorify God in the process. We're to take an attitude of Christ in receiving one another. It's the same effect that happens whenever we might wake up or, or something happened that we might be in a bad mood. And we might want to act on that bad mood. But instead of acting on that bad mood, and we've probably all experienced this, if we immediately fall to our knees and ask God to intervene, it's amazing the change when we get back up. It's a change. It's, that's the attitude that we're supposed to take on. When someone new comes into the congregation, into our spiritual family, the question is, do we properly welcome them into the family? Do we welcome them into the congregation? We should. It's part of one another, that love to one another. Here's the thing. If we don't even make an attempt to learn people's names or get to know them, if we don't even make that attempt, then we are falling short. We are falling short as our brother's keeper. As a member of God's church, as a member of the family of God, as a child of God, which we all are, we need to make sure that our goal is to meet every visitor, is to learn every new member that comes in as quick as possible, is to welcome them into the family, to be a part of the family. Number two, do we edify them or do we put stumbling blocks in their way? Do we edify them or do we put stumbling blocks in their way? You know, some months after his conversion, the man's name was Jerry, he said this, my greatest stumbling block has not been my old cronies out in the world that I used to hang around with, but the skeptical Christians waiting and watching for me to stumble. That's unacceptable. That is not the way a Christian should act. We, if we are acting that way, and I'm not saying we are, any of us are, but the point is, if we are, God knows. God's watching. And God will deal with it. Look at Romans chapter 14, verse 19. Romans 14, verse 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. This is what we're supposed to pursue. We're not supposed to pursue the idea of waiting or watching or saying, well, how long will it be before they quit? Or how long will it be before this happens or that happens? That's not a Christian attitude. We're supposed to edify. We're supposed to make way for peace and offer peace. This world's hard enough. And people go through enough. We don't need to have it in God's church, in God's house. So a follow-up to this question is, do we edify or are we stumbling block? A follow-up would be, as individuals, as individuals of God's family, are we bodybuilders? Now, I don't think any of us, too many of us, go out and hit the gym on a regular basis. Maybe, I know some of us do, but the rest of us don't. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. Bodybuilders. We're the body of the church. We're the body of Christ. Are we building each other up? Are we edifying each other, encouraging each other? The other side of the coin is, are we like a sickness or a disease that is weakening the members of the body of Christ? And if so, it will finally kill the members. We don't want to be associated with that at all. That is a life that Satan inspires. We don't want that at all. So we most definitely want to build each other up without question. We can do that in several different ways. J just a few. By our example. Now, <laughs> that puts it back on us. Are we living the right example? If we are not living the right example, then we are not edifying each other. It's that simple. So we need to make sure that we are living the right example so we can't edify the rest of the body. 
How about our words? Do we have encouraging words? When somebody uh, it, it comes in off the street, do we welcome them? Do we say hi? Somebody that we've known forever comes to us with a problem or issue. Do we encourage them? Or do we first thing out of our mouth say, well, you've sinned and you shouldn't have done this? No, don't do it that way. Use the godly approach. How about our attitudes? Do we have what we talked about earlier, the attitude of Christ? That's a great place to start. You know, it was said of Philemon that he refreshed the hearts of the brethren. Think about that. Wouldn't that be great to be said of us? Well, so-and-so, they've refreshed our hearts. Or we enjoyed coming to this congregation because we knew that no matter what kind of day or week we've had, we were going to be uplifted. No matter what. No matter what the sermon, the message, the sermon, whatever it was about, we were going to be uplifted. Wouldn't that be great? That's the kind of attitude, the kind of people that we need to become. Philemon was like that. We want people to be able to say that of us. But it has to be true. Point number three. Do we submit to them or arrogantly rule over them? And we read this earlier, there's Ephesians 5, verse 21. And it simply says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Sometimes that means simply turning the other cheek. You know, sometimes, as the old saying goes, we have to take one for the team. And that's okay, as long as it's in a proper perspective. You can't always keep turning, keep turning, keep turning. Sometimes it has to be dealt with. But in the very forefront, sometimes we just have to say, okay, I'm sorry, and move on. It might not even be our fault if we move on. The fact is that God tells us what he expects of us. And then he expects us to do it. He expects us to live it. He expects us to be that example. Number four, do we serve them in love or expect them to serve us? And you see example after example in the Bible. But I want to look at Galatians 5 verse 13 on this one. Galatians 5, verse 13. For you, brethren, he's addressing each and every one of us sitting here. For you, brethren, you have been called to liberty or freedom, freedom from this world, freedom from the way of uh, Satan. He said, you have been called to liberty. Only do not use this liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. This goes back directly to the example, the attitude of Jesus Christ. How many times in our life can we go back and look and, and see where we've been given a second chance or another chance? Maybe a third, fourth, fifth, I don't know. But we've been given another chance, another opportunity. Do we take that opportunity and reflect Jesus Christ in that? Or do we take that and get puffed up and demand something from somebody else? I mean, you, you look back in the example of the, the king who forgave the debt of his servant, and the servant went and did not forgive the debt of his um, comrade there. That is not how we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to as it says here, take the freedom, take the calling, take the opportunity, and use it to glorify God, not the opportunity of the flesh. Number five, do we demonstrate hospitality to them? This is First Peter 4. Do we demonstrate hospitality to them? First Peter 4, verses 8 through 10. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards 
of the manifold grace of God. Through God's grace, he has given each and every one of us a gift or gifts or whatever. The point is we are to use those to edify the body, each other. So how do we demonstrate this kind of hospitality to others? Well, one way is by visiting them in their need. Most all of us, you could probably say all of us, have some kind of need. And maybe it's something big or maybe it's something small. But the point is, we all have something we need. As we become closer to one another, as we start learning one another, we find out what that need might be. And then as we try to live the example of love one another, being our brother's keeper, we try to supply comfort to that need, whatever it is. Maybe we can in a little way, maybe we can in a big way. The point is we make positive progress. That's what we're supposed to do. How about by inviting them into your home or accepting an invitation into their home? That's what it's about. And that's how we become at one with each other. That's how we learn each other. We have to get to know each other. God expects us to. There's another area here that we should uh, consider before we start to conclude on this. When a brother is overtaking in fault, we've all experienced that, we've all seen that. This can be one of the lowest times in a fellow Christian's life. They can be trying to do everything they possibly can, and sometimes a fault comes. A lot of times a fault comes. It happens. We're Christian, we're human. But the person can become very vulnerable at this time in their life. Do we ever consider that? Have we ever stopped to consider them in this time that they may be going through? This is where I want to look at Hebrews 10 and verse 24. Now this scripture we read last week, but it has a very, very good application here. Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25. <clears throat> And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. The important question to ask ourselves here is, are we aware of who they are and what's going on? Now, that becomes a fine line because we don't want to pry. We want to respect people's privacies. But by the same token, we want to at least offer the encouragement of inquiry. What's going on? Do you want to talk about it? And if not, that's fine too. We can still pray for them. We don't have to know the details. God knows the details. We just want to be able to understand if there is something that somebody needs prayer for, go to God and ask. God is loving and merciful. He'll take care of the problem. We think about this, though. Are we aware of the problem? And if we are, what can we do to help? You know, we said prayer, but there's so much more. You know, prayer is first and foremost. But it might be, um, here a few years ago, I had a problem. I had a broken leg, and I was out of firewood. <laughs> Doesn't seem like a big problem until it's January and you don't have your firewood and that's how you heat your house but the people of the church saw a need they jumped in and they took care of it and at the end of the winter I still had a couple wheelbar loads left whenever you do the right thing when you attempt to do the right thing God blesses you and that's exactly what he has done and that's what he will continue to do for all of us but it's extremely important, as we read here in Hebrews 10, and verse 24 and 25, to assemble together. And assembling together, we do a couple of things. We do a lot, but there's a couple of main points. Number one, first and foremost, we worship and praise God. But in doing that, we also worship and praise God with each other. We share an opportunity there. We get to know each other in that way. That is extremely valuable when we can meet together 
and we can share that kind of a personal thing. It's very, very valuable. It goes just to the point of, you know, doing other events, activities that the church puts on. You know, whether it's Bible studies, discussion groups, or church socials, if at all possible. We need to be there because you'll get so much more out of the group talking than we will by ourselves. There's several, when you have a group, there's several different perspectives. And most everybody here has been around for, <laughs> I want to say 100 years, but maybe not quite that long. But we've been around a while. So we have the truth, but we have it from different perspectives. We have different lives, different backgrounds. So we have it from different perspectives, but it's still the truth. And that's how we can learn. It, it's, it's, a, it's a very encouraging thing to do. All these can be very beneficial and will be very beneficial in our spiritual growth, as well as our social growth. And it doesn't matter what age we are. We all can benefit from it. It's a great thing. In verse 25 here in Hebrews 10, it tells us to exhort one another and encourage one another. It's not a suggestion. This is what he's saying, do. Do this. Well, one of the reasons this is stated here is to the point that very few people in the world offer this kind of encouragement. They just can't. They don't have God's spirit. This is a kind of encouragement and a kind of exhortation that only comes from the spirit of God. And if we're not together, how can we um, lift each other up? The last thing that we should want as God's people is for someone to start to drift away. We should all take that personal, especially if nobody makes an effort to reach out to them and talk to them. Let's look at Hebrews 3. For, it's an encouraging uh, section of Scripture here on this. Hebrews 3, verses 12 through 14. <clears throat> says, take care, take heed, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. This is talking about enduring. And if you notice verse 13 there, it said, but exhort one another every day, not just on Saturday, every day. Here's the thing, you know, we've seen what's happening in the world today. The past six months have been crazy. And I guarantee we've seen nothing yet. It's going to get a whole lot worse. And if we don't encourage each other every day, we stand to fall. We don't want to be sucked in by what's going on in this world. You know, God said, come out of this world. Now, saying that, he realized we have to live in this world, we have to survive in this world. When he said, come out of this world, that means don't be a part of it. Don't take into what they're doing. Stay out of it. We have to encourage each other because Satan's pulls are extremely strong. And he's going to use everything he can. Satan knows his days are short. He's going to try everything he can, as hard as he can. So we have to fight back. And part of fighting back is encouraging each other. Pick the phone up. Send a card or a note. Send an email or a text. Anything. Stay in contact. That's what we need to do. If we truly love each other and a the way God has told us to, we need to approach each other with humility. With humility and the character of God. That's the way we do it. Because if we do it that way, we won't offend. If they won't accept us, then it's not because we didn't try. You know, sometimes people just say no, and they run. And they run, and, and they, will, they will run out of the church. That happens. It's unfortunate, but it happens. But it can't be because we are not trying. Finally, point number six here, I want to look at this last point. 
Are we willing to bear their burdens? And this is the one I told you. This is the tough one. Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2. It seems like we all have enough burdens to bear, right? I mean, now we're wanting to bear somebody else's. Galatians 6, verse 1 and 2. It says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Key word there. <laughs> spirit of gentleness. Just like we said, approach him in humility and approach him in the character of God. It said, You should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bearing each other's burdens simply means finding out what we can do to help. Sometimes it's only a matter of praying. Sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's physical. They need something done. Most of the time, it's by prayer. And we all can do that. No matter our age or our physical shape, we can do that. A big part of our calling is to help one another. It's to help our brothers and sisters in Christ to overcome and to be a stronger Christian. We should want, if we make it our goal to make everybody else a stronger Christian than we are, then we all win if we all do that. But that's what we have to do. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 here. Ephesians 4 and verse 32. <clears throat> Ephesians 4 and verse 32. <clears throat> and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. We look back at that and we see that pattern again. We see the obligation. We see the sufficiency and the motive. We see it all right there in that, that scripture. This is what we're to do. This is how we're to live. You know, fear of not being forgiven and accepted back into the family of God, that may keep someone from repenting. And that may keep someone from returning to the fold. And that, it's a shame. And if we have anything to do with that, Shame on us for, for being a part of it. We need to make sure that we are the other type of Christian, the Christian who welcomes, who encourages, who motivates, who edifies. Well, the list goes on. That's the kind of person we need to be. We must come to a place where we can communicate to each other a willingness to accept with open arms for whatever and offer complete forgiveness for whatever. That's the character of God. And that's where we need to come to. So as we conclude here, how we answer these questions that we pose here today, this will reveal to us, if nobody else, to us and to God, because God already knows, because he knows our heart, it will reveal what kind of a Christian we are, what kind of a person we are. If we're falling short in these areas, and as the old saying goes, we're still on the green side of the grass, we have time to change. We have time to fix it. It's never too late. But we must, absolutely must, be fulfilling our responsibilities to be our brother's keeper in everything that that encompasses, living up to that responsibility. And that responsibility includes to love one another as Christ loved us, as God the Father loved Christ. This needs to be the foundation of our Christianity. And if it's not, we can make it. It's not too late. Again, as long as we're on the right side of the grass, it's fine. We can keep doing it, and we need to keep doing it. So I'm going to close with a section of Scripture that we already read, but uh, it's very fitting, and it's John 13, verses 34 and 35. John 13, verses 34 and 35. It says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another.